All right. Well, um, while David's getting his mic hooked up, um, Ed gave my bio. It's very accurate. And um, I, around just before the age of six, I was brought into this my lab program. Um, it's kind of a, I guess we all know, it's kind of a blanket uh, and uh, universal term for people that are serving in these programs. Uh, the people in the programs don't call themselves my labs. They will say they're in this program or that program. Uh, my lab is something that was coined outside of the programs and is used you know, in presentations such as this one. So, um, now, just before I was six, I was brought in, and uh, they began to, uh, how they brought me in was that they uh, did testing on me and uh, standardized testing in school. And through that standardized testing, they were able to identify me as an intuitive empath. And uh, there, are, there are a lot of intuitive empaths out there, but ones that have genetic predisposition and uh, spiritual disposition uh, to be able to be used by the military to interface with extraterrestrials is a, is a much lower number, especially in the military. They can't hardly find them. When they do, they utilize them, they overutilize them. So, intuitive empaths that are good at or have the ability to interface with these human beings are highly coveted and sought after. So, and, and when you're brought into the different programs, you're treated like an outsider as well. So let's say if you're in one my lab program and you're sent to support a, 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 a secret access program, technology program, you'll go in and you'll be treated as an outsider, mainly because of your age and your, uh, you don't have military training. The, uh, the my lab programs are not as prevalent now. They, they're not bringing people out of schools and uh, bring them in unbeknownst to their parents. A lot of the people that are up, uh, or youth, youths that are going into these programs are going in with their uh, parents' blessing. Most of them are former, former military and have signed contracts that uh, made it possible as well. So they're not pulling them out of the public sector as much as they were in the past. A lot of it has to do with uh, the, uh, all of the media that's been concentrating on my labs. David, do you have anything to add about my lab? Okay, excellent. David, thank you for joining us. And we were sure. talking about the my lab, so jump on in. I don't hear my voice in my headphones, but are you guys hearing me as I, my mouth is moving? Yes, we're hearing you, correct. Yes. And is the quality of my audio consistent? You're very clear, yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Corey's at, the, Corey's at a hotel. We won't say which one, but the hotel internet might be a little bit uh, lacking in quality. <laughs> Yeah, it's very much so. He's definitely not sounding as ideal as he could, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've been aware of this stuff for a long time. Uh, there was a there's actually an illustration in my book somewhere of what appears to have been uh, my lab contact that I had uh, in high school, where I drew these extraterrestrials. Let's see if I can find it here. Um, there's a there's a log of images at the front. It's pretty. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, here we go. 155. This is actually the, the book hasn't been released yet, but they sent me some copies of it. Uh, so I don't know if you can, you can see this, but if you look carefully at this illustration, this is something I drew in high school when I was, uh, obviously my name wasn't Marsha Shalou yet. That only came later in my life. You know, I've, the transition's going very well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke for everybody because <laughs> <laughs> i'm listed as marcia shallow right so if you look here um this was something that i drew after i was uh listening to the rolling stones and the song sister morphine and mick jagger sings why does the doctor have no face and this image uh flashes into my mind now what you see here is it looks like possibly a ufo hovering over someone lying on his back on the ground, and there's two people bended at the waist looking down at him uh, with the UFO hovering over them as if I was being contacted or in the process of levitation. But then if you really look closely, what's weird about this is that the, the jaws on these beings, now they're not, 
they're not really grays, are they? They got this weird square military jaw. And it was only years later that I figured out, okay, maybe this is a my lab and uh, it doesn't appear that most people who go through this ever remember anything at all. I th from what Corey has shared with me and some other insiders I've spoken to, this is actually far, far more widespread than people realize. Would you agree with that, Corey? Absolutely. And one of the technologies, technologies they use does not allow you to see their face. Oh, really? Yeah. You see a, a blur, a blur in front of the face, or just nothing. I mean, it's 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 a hard thing for people to wrap their heads around because we're dealing with an oppressive society of secretive people who are messing with us and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, I think it's important to maintain perspective on this and realize that there are cosmic laws of free will and we are being returned unharmed. Most of the people that are going through this are not having any lasting damage from this. So there is some kind of a contact taking place, but um, I don't think that that some of these more horrible fear porn scenarios are actually what's happening to people even if they are having this contact so and i just wanted to to add one thing as well david from um i've interviewed several super soldiers all over the world that have come forward and from yeah. what i understand uh, is that they get uh put into like sort of trip chairs like the matrix and they sort of extract their soul and put them into avatars to send them on missions to the jungle of Thailand or whatever. So there's All that stuff is done, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, one of the things that was fascinating, many things that are fascinating in terms of when Corey and I started to compare notes was that uh, my colleague, Dr. Pete Peterson, actually invented a technology um, that uses what they call the ports on your back. And actually, there is, there's a chapter in this um, called Pete Peterson, the Tesla of Black Ops, in which I described this invention. The government was doing research on the nervous system, and they found that all the nerves cross over into like a radial pattern in the middle of your, uh, of your shoulder blade. So if you actually feel around here on your shoulder blade, you'll notice there's like a little dip or a little divot in there. And that's actually what they found when they traced out the nerves is that for some reason that seems to have nothing to do with human survival or any value in any regular evolutionary or biological sense, there's this massive nexus of cross crisscrossing nerves that go throughout the whole body that intersect right on these points in the shoulder blades. And so he was able to invent something that can actually pump these longitudinal waves or scalar waves, special type of energy into those points and actually introduce visual images, audio, and thoughts directly into the mind. And we recently demonstrated this to a very well-known Las Vegas tycoon uh, at a, he was taken into a fighter jet that was parked at one of these military bases in the area. And they allowed him, because the fighter jets, you don't need windows anymore because of this technology. So it's a vision system. And you have these two little metal nubs that go into your ports on your back and then you can see with your eyes closed whatever you want to look at, and it also has binocular zooming vision. And this is something that I started to talk to Corey about, and he knew all about it because he'd actually used it. So they do use this technology. It's not like the movie The Matrix where they're jacking in through the back of your head. It's actually your shoulder blades, but the point is the technology does exist. I know who invented it, and there's a whole chapter on that in my new book. So this is all part of things we're gonna be able to have access to once we get disclosure. You can download whole languages, you can download all kinds of information directly in your mind. Yeah, you can get a college education in about 30 minutes. <laughs> it's true, I mean, that it's one thing to hear about this stuff, it's another thing when you can interview the person who invented it and get like two or three hours of much more information depth than you'd ever be able to comprehend and ask questions and get ins answers that are so specific that you basically get lost within the first five minutes and you just kind of meditate and hope that you can maybe understand some of what he's explaining to you. You know, I, I have a fairly good idea of it. He didn't give me enough technical detail to understand exactly how the waves are created or how they generate thoughts, but you can basically record thoughts from one person and replay them into someone else. You can take visual images from a camera, 
and turn them into thought forms that actually appear in the brain as visual images. And apparently it has an incredible zoom capability. So it makes it, it's like you have a God's eye view. You have much better vision with much more telescopic capability than you normally would have as a regular human being. It's quite amazing stuff. Yeah, a lot of the remote optics that they use in a uh, secret space program craft, there is, there's not a lens, there's not a camera, but they're able to view vast different distances and zoom up incredibly close on them. Yeah, that's consistent with exactly what we demonstrated to this Vegas tycoon um, and his quote, we can't say the last word because it's a four letter word, but you know, the first, the first three words that he said before the fourth one were holy goddamn. And so we call it the holy goddamn machine in the book. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, they, look, when you look at movies like Divergent and Ender's Game and you see people in these movies that are running through simulations, they're not really talking fictionally. Um, we just, the first review came in of the book because, you know, the, the major publishing houses get an advanced look at it. And we got a review from Publishers Weekly and it was quite, uh, quite frosty. And they're kind of, the, I talk about how fiction discloses the reality and they're talking in the, you know, when they reviewed the book, they basically said something about how I'm trying to legitimize my fantasies of science fiction as if they're actually factual. But what is going on, and we all know this already, everybody listening I'm sure is aware of this, they're using fiction to tell you the truth so that if somebody like me or Corey comes forward and tries to tell you the truth, they say, oh, he's just a fan of that movie or this movie or whatever. He, he loved The Matrix. He loved Divergent, you know. They're no, they're mind. showing you exactly what they do in these films. That's why they're made. As you pointed out in wisdom teachings from the Sony hack, we saw how closely Sony and, and other uh, similar companies work with ARPA and other military industrial companies. That's exactly correct. Uh, this is a little known fact. Uh, WikiLeaks hacked the Sony emails, and of course, the mainstream media got all upset about it and said, we can't believe this was done. It's such an invasion of privacy. Everybody has a basic right to privacy. Our right was violated. Da, 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 da. Okay, dude, I get you, right? I wouldn't want my emails blown all over the internet. I don't always say the most loving things on my emails, but if you were to find out that I was actually receiving money and tutoring from RAND, which is the military industrial complex think tank, and that people are coming over to my house to have meetings about how I can basically promote that agenda, there was never supposed to be a direct link between the military industrial complex and films. And yet now we have absolute undeniable proof in these emails that DARPA and, and RAND and these other types of agencies that are, because RAND is just the front, right? It's got DARPA behind it. It's got DIA. It's got these other agencies. But they are actually having full day meetings at Sony. And what's even crazier is that they're giving exact notes on how certain films should or should not be worded. One of the most interesting things also was some notes from Rand on how to word an article about Snowden in which all of the aspects of wording that would imply that the US had done anything wrong are sanitized and it becomes that Snowden's the bad guy and that these are just normal da bulk data collection things that are going on. Nothing, nothing bad at all. So. Yeah, there's, we know this stuff. We know there's a direct connection between the military industrial complex and the media. And Corey and I are almost a lone voice in terms of the, the, the scope of the disclosure. We've had threats against our lives. It's ongoing. It's not necessarily a fun job, um, but we're doing it. And the, the payoff is worth the sacrifice. If we get full disclosure, the effect that's going to have on our society is unimaginable. To have a portal in your own home and you can portal over to Pluto and, and have a friend on Pluto, that's going to be our daily reality. You're not going to have to worry about this. And most people can't even imagine that that's what's coming so soon in our future. But it is. If we get the full disclosure, that's what we're going to have. I just wanted to also quickly add uh, someone like a uh, very prominent guy, Robert De Niro, uh, put together yeah. a, a, an amazing documentary on vaccinations. And what they do, they shut him down real quick and that's from his son that got a vaccination and now has you know 
was messed up by us. So we see this across the board. So as David and all of us are doing is we need to unify and get this information out there. And I just want to say we had a couple of questions really quick. Uh, David, I recently read on your website a comment that references one of your comments that being you stating we live on a flat earth. I hadn't heard <laughs> at all. In fact, quite opposite. I'm confused. Can you clarify that, David? Okay. Let's talk about this because I'm doing a new video for YouTube right now about this problem. Corey and I are probably going to tape together on this because he's in Boulder right now, as he just said in his last vlog. Um, so there are like 20 different YouTube channels that all appear to be run by the NSA or some other division thereof of a similar type of group. And they are rampantly taking old radio shows that I did, and this goes back to interviews from 2007, 2009, 2010, and they're saying, new, 2016, David Wilcock, da 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 And we've identified already three different channels that actually use my name and my photograph and are posing as if they were me. And then they're answering people's comments. They're putting up videos. In some cases, the videos get well over a five-figure number of, of hits because I've got this branding out there from being on Ancient Aliens and having the two shows on Gaia that are weekly shows, et cetera, et cetera. Look, this flat earth thing is a fucking joke. Excuse my French. There is no flat earth. If you walk from one side of the earth to the other or you sail in a sailboat, you're going to go back to where you started. Okay, you're not going to fall off the edge. And I'm sorry, but this whole thing is a deliberately designed con from the NSA groups in order that certain individuals in our community could be lured in by a narrative that's going to make them look absolutely troglodyte ridiculous to everybody else in our community who may, may be an awakening person to the truth. Look, we, get, we can go all the way back to Aristarchus and his simple depictions of the roundness of the earth using, you know, stuff like a sextant and, and simple rods in the ground. And then and we can go into things like the Coriolis effect and the fact that when you fire a cannon that you have to bend the target from where you think it would go because the cannon's actually going to spin in the air based on the rotation of the round earth. And the thing that I find most ridiculous is probably a lot of the people that are putting this stuff out, the videos themselves are actually run by the government. They're made by government agents. And then the people who appear to be supporting those videos and being so argumentative in the comments sections, they also are government agents. None of this stuff is true. You look at the moon, you can see it's a ball and that it's rotating, you know, based on where the sun's phase angles are. So, for God's sake, don't get sucked into the flat earth nonsense. It's just a joke. Yeah, thank, so you, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and the flat earth it was originally a thought experiment by the NSA, and it also uh, works in NASA science as well, is to see how, uh, how well they could affect the belief systems and understanding of a certain group of people. So uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's a deeper experiment. There's a deeper experiment behind it as well. And, and Corey, a, a quick question for you. Um, how can you validate that the info from the inner Earth civilizations are true? I'm referring to the ones Martinez lived for a short time. Any uh, information on that, please? Yeah, um, well, I, I can only go off of my intuitive abilities to be able to uh, say what they're saying is true. You know, there are so many different trickster beings out there that I approach all of them the same. That I, I don't just sit there and get all blue-eyed and white-eyed. I'm being in, con I'm in contact with another being and then just, oh, tell me all the knowledge, you know. If you're that way, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get twisted up very quickly. There are a lot of uh, trickster beings out there pretending to be from the light. Now, Gonzalez, you definitely want to project your voice, buddy, because when you get that quiet, you're basically non-audible. Okay. Yeah. I may have to look this up here. It's my... Gonzalez stayed with them for a protracted long period of time. 
uh, compared to any other humans that I knew of. And he ended up wearing out his welcome because he was walking around, he was pacing off all the uh, corridors, making mental maps, and was trying to gather intelligence for the SSP Alliance. And there are people in the SSP Alliance that do not take everything that the inner earth groups say as gospel. So they're, they're investigating. You know, uh, from the military standpoint, each group have, these inner earth groups have lied to them in the past. They told them they're from other star systems. They, they just give them you know, uh, information that threw them off of the trail that would lead them back to their uh, headquarters or uh, where they reside. So that has a lot of the people in the military and industrial complex a little bit uh, leery of believing everything that this group is saying. And David, this is a question maybe uh, you can answer or, or, or uh, uh, this is coming from uh, Krista and Sedona, one of my star sisters. Shout out to Krista. She wants to say first that she loves both you guys and thanks you both for your service. Cool. And uh, <laughs> follows your work. She wants to know, uh, was there a trial recently held with certain Dracos being held accountable for their earth crimes? Any, any information on that? No, that nothing like that has happened according to my intelligence. Yeah. yeah, um there is a there's a big difference between what's going to happen and what's happened. Um I wanna also respond we'll get back to that. I wanna respond to what Corey was saying on the previous question first, and that is um we do have some pretty interesting corroborations that have taken place. Corey had met with me privately and um, had told me about a particular inner earth group that had a kind of an extended nose. Um, and then we went and saw Jupiter Ascending, the movie. And in the movie, he's sitting next to me in the movie theater because we watched it together. It was the first time he'd come out to Los Angeles before we ever, anybody knew who he was or he, his, he, his face was not public, his name was not public. We watched this film. And as he saw that being in the movie, his whole body goes, <gasps> and he actually gasped. And then we find out that there was this thing called the Shaver Mysteries. This guy, Richard Shaver, claimed that he'd been brought to the inner earth and was given all this information about beings that looked the same with this kind of elephant-type trunk nose. And then we found another guy online who uh, calls them the Darrow, and his name is uh, Brenton Sawin, I believe. And he is claiming that he had contact from these beings, very negative abduction attempt. So the inner earth is a subject that very few people have interfaced with, very few people seem to have had these experiences, but I was able to not only correlate these different things together because Corey had never heard of the Shaver Mysteries, yet a lot of what they say in there validates very nicely what he said. I presented about this two years ago at Contact in the Desert, um, and I probably will do some kind of video about this. So the inner earth thing, is also mirrored in the law of one. And it was funny because there's people who are portraying themselves as if they were law of one experts and then saying, oh, there's nothing about the inner earth in the law of one. David's making it all up. Corey's making it all up. So there's a bunch of wisdom teachings episodes that go back maybe to earlier this year that I did on Gaia where you can actually watch them and I'm showing you quote after quote after quote after quote from the law of one about inner earth civilizations that they're part of this so-called confederation that's guiding our evolution, our ascension, and that they are going to be very pivotal in the ascension process. So it makes sense that if they do exist, that they would start by contacting people like Corey and getting us ready for this big change that they're anticipating is going to happen. Regarding the Draco, they are not so much on trial right now as that they are trying to escape our planet because they're anticipating either a kill shot type event or a trial or both. And what has happened, which is really exciting, is that the military industrial complex here on Earth, which is partly controlled by the good guys, what we're calling now the Earth Alliance. I used to just call them the Alliance before I'd heard about a secret space program alliance. The Earth Alliance has technology now capable of shooting down Draco ships. So there have been efforts of the Draco to try to escape, primarily from the area of Antarctica, and they have been summarily shot down. 
Uh, so there's a large contingent of them in Antarctica. They have massive bases under the ice there where there's these natural volcanic pockets that keep it warm enough that they can breathe and live, and they're not able to escape. So in the future, it does appear that we will see some sort of public trials coming out. And it's an exciting development that uh, I've been asked actually in my dream state if I would participate in those, and I, was, I answered that I would. So it's going to be intense. I mean, when people find out what's been done to them, it's going to be shocking. And I'd like to throw this back to Corey for a second because he has an update that we really need to get out on this show. And that was just released in his uh, part one that he put out a couple days ago about a different extraterrestrial civilization, very similar to humans, that were also enslaved by the Draco, and they have already thrown them off. So, Corey, why don't you just briefly, because I know we need to cover this, so you probably should get it in there while we have a chance. Sure. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> on a fairly recent meeting where I was taken by a blue spear to uh, talk to your era. I, when I arrived, there was a person, call them people, there was a person, silhouette, standing next to me. And as they got closer, I saw that it was not a, a human from Earth. It, uh, he, he had skin texture that looked very much like you see in, in North Africa, like you know, Libya, uh, Egypt, those kinds of those, those countries. They had a kind of an orange, uh, it's an orange hue to them, a little bit, like the orange glow. Like so he, um, he spoke to me in perfect English without any accent, which blew my mind. I expected some sort of uh, nonverbal communication. And he let me know that they had been studying us for a long period Corey, of time. Corey, you got to hold your mic closer to your mouth. A lot of people can't hear you. Okay. Um, he informed me that his people had been watching our people for a long period of time. They had been watching our television, our radio. They'd been all through our internet. And they were, were gathering information on us because they want to come after we have thrown off the shackles like, like they did, just a few iterations ago. Yeah. And, uh, one of the things I didn't add is he said that their life cycle was 300 uh, revolutions around their star. So that, and whatever fair year is, it's, you couldn't equate it uh, over to Earth or anything. So what he also communicated was that in the past, his people had been on Earth as refugees. That many times in the past, the Earth had uh, been sort of a, an ET commune, almost. That many different groups that were having issues in their star system came to Earth and found refuge and lived relatively in peace with the inhabitants here and each other. So. That's, uh, is there something else? Well, Corey, they also told you, or Mika, this guy's name was Mika. He also told you that, uh, and this is just, I, I have the same information everybody else does because I read the update you wrote, that he told you that in the future, we could end up collaborating with them, right? Yes, yes. That's, that's, the, that's the, whole reason, yeah, the whole reason that they have been studying us is that uh, he told me that uh, the problems of his people were not as significant as ours, and complicated as ours on Earth, but that there were enough correlation that they would be very instrumental and helpful in our transition after we've thrown off the shackles. And it's the same group that had enslaved his people, the Draco Alliance, which is made up of reptilian and these insectoids, as well as these tall, blonde, fairly big forehead and mean six fingers. Uh, that a lot of people will call Nordics, but they are uh, a human race that, they're a conquered race that are in servitude to this, uh, this Orion. Well, and the other thing, Corey, which your update, there's, there's some very significant developments that have happened as a result of this update, and this appears to be the most immediate way we can discuss this, uh, since we're doing this and it's live and, and we're on video as well. 
Um, first of all, there was a very intense amount of discussion you gave about the idea of some kind of solar event. Yes. And um, this is actually something that I started to talk about intensely in source field investigations, my first book. I didn't really talk about that much in Synchronicity Key, but now I very much talk about it in the new book with all kinds of references to ancient scriptures of different religions. You got Islam, you got Hinduism, you got Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Christianity. I mean, they all are predicting pretty much the same thing. And when you really kind of do your homework, and this also includes, I did some great new research in here on Greek and Roman philosophy. Specifically, there's a philosophy called Stoicism. And there's a word you can look up, and I'm finally going to put this out there. I didn't want it stolen from me before this point. But the word is ekpyrosis. And there's different ways to spell it, but you can look it up right now. Try this one, E-K-P-Y-R-O-S-I-S. That's one way to spell it. Another way to spell it is E-C-P-Y-R-O-S-I-S. Now, what is ekpyrosis? It is a widespread belief in many philosophical teachings from Greece and Rome that the sun is going to give off this massive flash of energy. So it's not just the religions. If you look up ekpyrosis, it is the science, and it's talked about in these various uh, philosophical texts from these guys that are called Stoics or Stoicism. And I'm looking at papers that have only had maybe 25 views online that are intense scholarly academic investigations of this widespread belief in Greek and Roman times that the sun was going to do this. But it all was kept in secret societies. It was swept under the rug. People don't know about this. They don't understand that we are not just talking about some ridiculous Christian rapture where, you know, the, the believers of the 144,000 fly up into the air like kites while everybody else burns in fire. This is a very widespread belief, which Corey's new information, Corey, I want to throw this back to you because this is another thing we definitely need to cover as, as soon as we can before we run out of time. You're hearing from all across the board, and I, of course, list, you know, multiple, all the insiders I know were telling me about this, and I put their testimony in here. Everybody's telling, everybody thinks this is going to happen on the inside. It's just a question of exactly what it is and what, it, what is it going to do, right, Corey? Exactly. <clears throat> Gonzalez, when he communicated with me what uh, was about the subject, had stated that out of all these different uh, uh, secret syndicates that run the world. They have a they don't have all they don't all have the same belief system. They have a wide spread wide spectrum of different beliefs, and some of them are more on the esoteric uh, end of, uh, spectrum and believe as we do that there's going to be some sort of ascension or energetic change, and it, they see it as something that they need to hide from. This ascension is not going to be good. Then there's this, uh, as you go up the ladder, you have people that think, okay, there's going to be a huge, uh, they're saying it's going to be a complete uh, coronal mass ejection. The entire corona of the sun is going to explode outwardly into the solar system. And the sun will go almost completely dark for a number of days. Uh, that's just what a number of days. Yeah, I had one insider tell me that they're expecting everything all the temperatures in the solar system will be at least 400 degrees Celsius when this takes place. I've heard that. It's, yeah. yeah, so there's, there's a catastrophe side of this, and some people think that's what it's going to be. Yes, and uh, these groups point to, and I don't know the details of the evidence, but they point to what they found within our solar system at some of these ancient sites. They found uh, that this, is a regular, this happens on a regular basis, and it happened in the past. We just... A lot of the ancient uh, archaeology that's in our solar system is damaged. A lot of it's damaged. And some warfare, natural disasters, all kinds of stuff. But these, a lot of these groups, as you start going up the ladder, they believe, okay, we'll get hit by this uh, CME, and then we'll lose all electronics, all electricity, or knock us back for a decade. So that'll, you know, that'll be the extent of it. And then there are other eggheads that, that they call scientists that believe that it's going to consume uh, the surface of the Earth. So, I mean, and then there's, in between each of those, there's people that have 
elites of what we have. But none of them are on the same page. Well, but I want to point out, I mean, that's the kind of thing that could put a stench of, of, of fear and horror around what we're discussing right now. Um, I want to point out that this is an investigation, and it's an investigation that, you know, again, you know, 500 pages barely even covered everything. All I did is give a thumbnail sketch and overview, but the idea is that when you actually look at these ancient scriptures, it appears that the people that inspired them or wrote them were benevolent extraterrestrials who know more about this than our government does because they have the ability to look outside of time and look outside dimensionality. And that's the key. It does appear that this is a dimensional shift in which we get into the real essence of what it means to be a human where you have as it said at the beginning of this talk, there was a little screen uh, grab there of, of an image of densities and different densities of reality. So this does appear to be something in which if you are ready for it, your body will transition into what is called in the Bible um, the incorruptible body. You know, that's just a, a Apostle Peter, in, it's 2 Peter 13 is one of the ones that talks about it. Um, then you go into other religious texts like Zoroastrianism, and they talk about this thing called Frasho Kareti, in which they say that the sun gives off something akin to a molten metal, like a light that's like molten metal, and that the wicked are consumed by it, but the just, whatever that, you can interpret what that means, and they do give some guidelines, that it's just this very intense energetic rush, but you don't have any other experiences negative. And the word Fraso Coretti in Zoroastrianism actually translates as making wonderful. So the, the teaching is that this is what makes the world a wonderful place to live. And that's very nicely uh, mirrored in the book of Revelations. When you see the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth that is formed by this. And also, Corey has described that there is some kind of interstellar rescue program from these various so called genetic farmer ET groups where they know that this thing's going to happen too. And even if you're not going to ascend, they will make sure that you're safe and they'll get you out of here before the big event hits. So only the people who are going to get, who, who need this thing to happen in a negative way, karmically will experience that way. Would you agree with that, Corey, what I just said? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, you can't forget the inner earth groups as well, that uh, in the past when we've had catastrophes, I don't, I don't. I think this one's going to penetrate the Earth fully. Um, I was shown an image of waves coming in, hitting the Earth's magnetic field, and holding over to the poles, coming into the center of the Earth, and then radiating out. So, wow. In the past, you know, these inner Earth groups have pulled humans in to save certain genetic life during catastrophe. I don't think that necessarily going to be possible with this. Um, Whatever it's going to be, and it's just it's, it's, it's kind of ignorant for these elites to think that they can hide, you know, a few miles underground and not be exposed. Yeah, I, I mean, Corey, let, let's let's discuss because I'm watching the clock ticking down here and it's going fast. Um, but I, I also have a bunch of questions, and when you get a chance, sure, Dave, sure. But that's why I wanted to get this in first. Absolutely. Um, one of the other things that uh, I, I want to see Corey make a public statement about this, because it's a very significant development, is that we have had his blue avians that he's in contact with, raw tear air, raw rain air, raw mare air, are now speaking to him. Since he started to read the Law of One as they asked him to, they're now speaking to him in exactly the same verbiage, same languaging that's in the Law of One, strongly suggesting that this is in fact who he's dealing with, that the Ra of the Law of One is who he's talking to, which makes a whole lot of sense. And so I want to make that statement first, which is already in your update, Corey, and then I wanted to also say this, which is in the Law of One, they explain that the 25,000 year cycle is an Earth evolutionary shift, but that at the end of the 25,000 year cycle, some people go, some people stay behind, they also say that there's a triplicity to the 25,000 year cycle. And at the end of three cycles, that the sphere itself 
is no longer habitable for third dimensional life. So that seems to correspond with what you're saying, Corey, which is that in fact, this is a global reset point. And if you don't have a light body, you're not gonna be here. It's not like regular flesh. And they actually say that in the Bible. It says in um, Corinthians, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That seems to be a religious view of the same idea of ekpyrosis, which is that if you're going to be here, you've got to activate your light body or you're just not going to be here at that point after this happens. Correct. And uh, going back to the law of one and the Canadians, after I was actually able to finally read the book, I had all kinds of blocks. I just couldn't read it. Um, I had this weird thing. We were in Joshua Tree or conference room, and I heard this chorus of voices saying, we are the messengers and facilitators of the one infinite creator. And it said it over and over and over. And I was like, what is going on? I went outside, looked around, came back in, came to someone in the room with me. And um, after that, I reached over and picked up the book, and I could read it. You know, the information was going in my head. The words were no longer hovering over the page. And after that, as David said, Peter Air began to communicate in the same type of language. But also, reading the book helped me get over a barrier where I could now converse a lot better with the agent. I could, I could ask questions and understand the, uh, all the details that they're trying to communicate. So it was a pretty big break. Yeah, so um, just, to, just to round out that thought, uh, I really encourage everybody not to have fear about this, despite the overwhelming aspect of what we're discussing, um, because this video may end up online and people who are not really conversant with the message are gonna be encountering this data. And we gotta be always really careful to respect the amount of fear that people could have when they encounter something like this if they're not really that spiritual. Um, I've had, I've been discussing Ascension online for 20 years. I started to participate in Richard C. Hoagland's online discussion forum in 1996. And I was already talking about this 20 years ago. People who are kind of ensconced in the material illusion are not gonna be too happy about the idea that there is an absolute point that will be reached in the not too distant future in which you either are going to ascend or you're going somewhere else. Everybody kind of wants to think, well, that's bad. And, you know, we need the world to just kind of keep on going and keep on going. And it's just going to stay the same. We don't like a big change. Big change is scary. How do I know if I'm going to send? How do I know if my dog is going to go with me? Blah, blah, blah. What if my kid isn't going to send? I don't want to send without my kids, you know, da, 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 all this kind of stuff. You have to understand that, first of all, on the pet question, we know that animals will become human in their next cycle. If most pets actually are now inspirited and they will be able to return as human and that's what we provide them as like their ascension. So don't deny your pet their own ascension to be able to become a human being. That's number one. Number two, children are innocent before a certain age and they're not going to be subject to the laws of karma. So even if your kid is rambunctious and causes trouble, most likely if you're ascending, your child is going to be ascending too. So you don't need to worry about that. Also, it appears from some of the stuff that I was told in the 90s that once ascension starts to happen, that it doesn't happen all at once. It goes in waves. And that people will be able to appear before those who haven't ascended yet in light body and tell them what happened and help them be prepared. And that's one of the subjects that we don't really know. Like, okay, is the solar flash just one flash or is it a series of flashes? And Corey, in your remote viewing, that you had remember it wasn't just one flash it was like no. a series of events it was it, it was yeah a sequence it was flash then flash 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 it, was, it happened like that implying that we are not just going to have one sudden event that's like that's it but that there could be phases of this we also have gotten new intel from three different interconnecting sources very interesting i've talked about this briefly regarding uh tankers and various ships that are very large, run by the Draco, that are cloaked in lower Earth orbit, that are actually restricting us from ascension that would already be happening to us now. 
and that these tankers, they, the, the military industrial complex now has the ability to shoot these tankers down. And there's two main ones apparently orbiting the earth. But if they do that, we will all be thrown into the equivalent of a psychedelic acid trip. And it's not a bad thing, but it's the scope of perspective change that will happen when you begin interfacing with the full thrust of this energy that's coming from the sun. You're going to have telepathy. You're going to have these paranormal abilities suddenly arise. And Corey, you talked about, and it'd be good to review that, that some of the SSP people experimented with these new solar energies and zapped people with them. And, and what happened to those people? Yes, they, they took people, put them in sealed rooms that were uh, uh, shielded and had them, the people were members of the SSP. They were scientists, technicians, that kind of thing. They would put them in this room and say, okay, do this job. And then the, uh, it would be one people, it would be multiple people. They would sit there, they'd do their normal job, not know anything was amiss, and then they would, what they call, pipe in energies to see how the people would react. Would they get sick? And what would happen? And what they found was that the people that were of uh, more positive polarity began to bliss out, began to sit back, their eyes, you know, got all, you know, I guess, sparkly, they would smile, or just, you know, very blissed out. But the people that were of more of a negative polarity, a lot of the uh, military types that had been in conflicts and, and that kind of thing, just, you know, their normal person that is just self serving in the same room had the same energies piped in, and they became uh, violent, they became, uh, they, they called it in-kind madness, is what they were calling it. So a, a lot of this has to do with our, how, what will happen ultimately, what we will experience ultimately has mainly to do with not only our polarity, how much surface to others we are, but um, our co-creative consciousness as, as a mass population. We're co-creating all of this at the same time that outside force is um, It's very complicated when you really start looking at it. You know, there's, we, we have a lot more say in what we're going to experience than we realize. And we can kept, kept ignorance of our co-creative. Um, uh, we've been kept ignorant of that on purpose to, so that we can use our co-creative consciousness against us and their black magic and Keep us yeah, I completely agree. Um, I just want everybody to know here, I do have a solid time commitment that I got to meet in uh, 14 minutes. So if you were saying that there were questions that we needed to address from the audience uh, and you want me to speak on something, I, I only have that window of time. I can't go any longer. Um, <laughs> yeah, same here. I'm arguing with the comments here. Um, so I, I, maybe the guy who was going to ask the questions is not online anymore. I don't see him on our panelist list. Um, uh, but somebody had asked, I, I'm looking at the comments here, and I'll just say this. Um, there was something about if, if, if the blue spheres are buffering the energy, then why are the Draco ships buffering it as well? And I think what's happening there is that the Draco are – deliberately restricting the things that would have given us a benevolent consciousness shift that would restrict their ability to control us, whereas the spheres seem to be more about making sure that the sun doesn't flash before the right time. Would you agree with that, Corey? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry, what did you say just before this? Because I had a comment about it. Uh, well, the Draco are doing their part to restrict oh, yes. our consciousness. Yes, and they, they use technology that keeps our consciousness contained and also makes us apathetic. So this technology of theirs is being affected by these energetic influxes in our solar system. And what I've been told is they basically got their uh, devices turned all the way up to 10 right now to be able to have the same effect they used to have before these energetic changes started yeah, and um, when we are dealing with such a monumental consciousness shift, these beings cannot afford to have us achieve that ascension. They don't want this to happen. And so, therefore, we're not going to have 
they're going to be allowed to do what they can do. They're, and, and I think that's an important point is that the benevolent beings are authorizing the Draco to do this. If they didn't want the Draco to do this, they could stop it. So there's some aspect of this in which spiritual growth has to take place in the dark. You're not allowed to know too much because then you wouldn't learn anything. That's a very basic law of one teaching. You have to be ignorant and ignorance is part of the equation so that from that lack of proof comes the exercising of faith, the exercising of will, and that's ultimately where spiritual mastery is made. You don't get spiritual mastery if you're happy and if you know all the answers. You get it when you're in pain and when you're suffering. And somebody had asked a question here about uh, service to self versus service to others and you know, what, where do we strike the balance between loving our enemies and having healthy boundaries. And, and this is thoroughly discussed in the law of one. It's a very fertile territory for spiritual investigation because the law of one does say that you have to protect yourself, that you have to have healthy boundaries. You do not want to allow negative forces to overwhelm you and, and dominate you. That being said, while you maintain your healthy boundaries, it's very important to have that cosmic consciousness of, why this is being done and that ultimately these beings are offering you service in their own way and that you can love them as a part of yourself ultimately as the one creator that is confused. So you hold that loving consciousness in your mind. You don't judge them. You don't hate them, but you also tell them, I can't let you do this. Corey, you're the only other guy who's unmuted. So yeah. Well, you agree with uh, that. I, 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 yes, I do agree with that. And it's, we may only have time for one or two questions, if uh, Richard. Yeah, yeah. We, we have about uh, eight minutes left, and I have a whole uh, list of questions, so I'm going to try to uh, bring them all together. Uh, first question is, real quickly, when's the next time both of you are going to be speaking? What event are you going to be speaking at, real quickly? just We don't have anything planned where we're both on stage at the same time right now. Ancient aliens. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. You're right, buddy. Alien Con. Uh, there's a, there's a Comic Con is now Alien Con. They're doing that as well. And that's going to be at the end of October. And Corey and I are going to have a panel of like an insider's SSP panel at that event. Excellent. There was also uh, several questions. I'm sort of going to combine them all. Um, one of uh, the lady's question was she has uh, believed she was part of the, the My Lab program and she has these uh, sort of uh, Im embedded dots on her back. She wants to know if that means possibly that she was part of the program. They're like scars on her back. On her back. Um, and how would you suggest to somebody to try to start remembering if they were part of these my lab type of programs? Are you, any suggestions, any protocols on how to reawaken those memories or how to try to, you know, get, in, get into, uh, you know, remembering that? Well, it could. Go ahead, Corey. Okay, sorry. The, um, the waves of overcoming the, the programming and the, and the mind control are as various as human beings that have had the mind control or memory wipes, blank slating, they call it. So I, I was in the three to five percent of people that they could not successfully mind wipe or reprogram totally. So I did not have to go through the steps of, you know, having little memories and then start to, you know, pull from them and, and, and recover them. I know that there's regression therapists. You have to make sure you pick one that's really responsible. They can, they can add memories and experiences where there are none. Uh, David, do you know of any protocols for recovering memories if you feel like you've been in one of these programs? Yeah. Um there's a, there's a variety of things, and I think it's really important to remember that this is a subject very much involve, involving your higher self, this aspect of you that's in what the Law of One would call sixth density that is directing all your incarnations from an overview perspective. And the higher self's goal is to promote your consciousness evolving at a speed that you can tolerate. So it's very important to be able to make contact with your higher self. And you can start out by using things like divination. Meditation is very important. As you progress, you'll discover that dreams can become very valuable. 
And it's very common for people to begin accessing these memories in the guise of dreams and meditation. You'll have a dream that has some fragment of it, and then that might trigger a memory that will start to live within you as it goes on. And I've had a lot of data come to me that way. Excellent. Uh, uh, another another uh, question, which uh, a couple people have uh, prompted about the blue a avions. We've heard a, a lot about them just the last few years. Can you talk a little bit about why just now they're coming into to the talk? Just why now we're hearing about them? Um, just the last few years, it seems a lot of information has been coming in. Well, Richard, the time where they're coming in to to contact connect with us? Richard, that's actually not the case. Um, we, we did a whole two episodes of Cosmic Disclosure with William Henry in which he did a masterful, prodigious amount of research to show that blue avians are all over the place in ancient Egyptian iconography, temple paintings. Uh, they show up in Buddhism. They show up in Hinduism. This is not anything new. It's just that beings apparently didn't want to show themselves to us until the right time in our history, but then we were able to go back to old history and find out that they were actually very prevalent. Got it. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, one more quick question uh, for both of you. Uh, is the chemtrails affecting people being able to contact with their higher self? I would say yes. Um, I've heard from insiders that there are alien chemtrails as well as cabal chemtrails and that both groups are both diff both types of chemtrails exist um the, the chemtrailing is is a multifaceted problem it's considered very serious our government doesn't want to tell us about it because part of it is being done by extraterrestrials apparently um but also again bear in mind that the benevolent forces are preventing anything from being weaponized to a point where it would really cause mass destruction. So none of this is ever going to be allowed to go beyond something that's more of like a splinter in the mind that triggers our awakening. It's not going to actually be something that could cause mass death. Uh, but yeah, chemtrails are real. We've heard a lot about this and that will be stopped as all this stuff unrolls and as we get disclosure and we get the defeat of the bad guys. So we're, we're in the last waning awesome. months or years of this being a problem. And I know that from uh, my show, Starseed Radio, we've had a lot of scientists on that have tested uh, chemtrails and have found multidimensional nanofibers in them, which is part of what they're doing is covering their, these multidimensional nanofibers, which respond to electromagnetic signals so they could fake an ET invasion or things like that. So there's a lot going on in that world. Who knows what the chemtrail program will, will come from. Uh, uh, one more uh, question. Uh, if you want to recall your past to see if you were part of any of the programs, quantum healing, therapy, um, look at DoloresCannon.com. I'm sure you both have known her, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and uh, also, before we go, if you have any information you'd like to give out, your website, webinars coming up, like you just said, uh, now would be the time. Cool. Uh, I, I got I to gotta jump, so I'll do that first. Um, I'm very excited about uh, working for Gaia and having two weekly shows. Corey and I are now finding other insiders and bringing them in. Cosmic Disclosure has had a quantum leap because we got this 94-year-old World War II veteran, William Tompkins, who has validated Draco reptilians, Antarctic ice bases, all kinds of amazing stuff, and we're coming out with that. I, I have his quotes and his testimony in this new book along with others. Uh, and it's, it's an amazing read. I would recommend it highly. If you pre-order it, you save money, and you help us get on the New York Times bestseller list. Corey and I are speaking at AlienCon coming up, and he and I are actually about to be meeting in person as well, so I'm not seeing the last of him. But uh, anyway, I want to thank all of you guys. Um, my website is divinecosmos.com. I just released a new video. I highly recommend seeing it. It's called The Ascension Mysteries, two hours long. I have a really cool cinematic intro that I designed myself in there. And I have a new website, which is dwilcock, D-W-I-L-C-O-C-K.com, that you can use to sign up for Ascension updates coming straight from me. And so put your email in on that, and you'll be in on that group list as well. So uh, I was glad to participate today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody, for being out there. And thank you, Corey, for 
bringing me in on this. It's it's been awesome. And uh, real quickly before you go, if you could just leave us with one quote or one way that everyone listening, participating can help with this ascension or raise their vibration, what would you tell everybody? Just the one sentence, one one quote. Well, we used to joke about this because the law of one message is extremely simple. And if there were only three words that the beings really wanted you to know, it would be just be nice. And if you can really, seriously though, the, we make it complex. We like complexity. Our minds want complexity when in fact, all you have to do in the service to others path is just be kind, compassionate, forgiving, patient, loving, and the challenge is how to apply that in the world that is throwing all these obstacles at you that challenge you to not be patient, forgiving, loving, and kind. And so the more that you can practice that, especially in the times when you normally wouldn't feel loving at all, that's really the key. Excellent. I also, from what I've learned, one piece is it's all about self-empowerment. At the end of the day, that's the biggest secret they don't want us to know is just how powerful yeah. each of us are. So and I do have my... Uh, since everybody's talking about t-shirts in the discussion, oh, I'm wearing my contact in the desert. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, David, for your service you, and work. Really appreciate you. it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yes. Right. And before we go, uh, any last words, comments, and uh, updating events that you wanted to give out? Uh, sure. I'm I'm giving my first solo conference. <clears throat> excuse me, at uh, Mount Shasta here, and uh, it's like. <clears throat> about a week now. And I started a new vlog. If you go to YouTube and look for good vlog, my last name, G-O-O-P-E, 